Hello and uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Pricing for Success and we'll be looking at a number of innovative business models for OTT and we'll be looking at some of the different business models as well, uh, some that are out there and some that aren't currently out there. Um, my name's Peter Brownbill uh, and I'll be hosting today's webinar for you. Uh, I head up all media and entertainment for MPP Global Solutions across EMA. Um, naturally, we've got a very short window of time today, so it'll be hosted at quite a high level. But I'm delighted to discuss anything you have of interest in greater length uh, in due course, and please get in contact with me after the webinar. I'll provide you with my contact details um, right at the end. For those who don't currently know of MPP, but I'm sure most of you do by now, uh, MPP provide the market-leading identity management, CRM, and e-commerce platform, uh, which we call eSuite, and we work exclusively within the entertainment and media sector. Um, we're very much specializing in advanced identity management, CRM, and monetization of digital content, and we're very delighted to be working with some of the biggest names uh, in the industry, such as Sky, Now TV, Foxtel, Daily Mail, and very much Philips on a worldwide basis. If you want to know a little bit more about any of those organizations and what we do for them, if you visit our website at mppglobal.com, we have some case studies, uh, we also have some white papers, and again, some we can provide you with more detail if you request. Just covering off some very straightforward housekeeping pointers, um, we'll be answering all the questions at the end of the presentation, just to make sure it doesn't become too disjointed. Uh, so please don't be shy, if you've got any questions, uh, please, uh, type them in the box and we'll answer them at the end of it if we've got time. We'll also uh, distribute all the questions and responses and answers um, to everybody as part of that as well. Just to kick off really to, to tell you what we'll be covering, uh, there are a number of areas that we'll be looking at uh, and we'll be covering each one of these off. We'll be looking at the opportunities in OTT, we'll be looking at some of the current OTT business models, uh, the emerging ones, some that are in place actually, and some that um, we believe is an opportunity to put in place, and also we'll be looking to the future, uh, what the future will bring for OTT. First of all, more and more, um, we've seen you know, the new disruptors coming into the market with different models, uh, moving into what can only be now considered to be quite a crowded market, uh, and the whole idea of that is catching the attention of those people who are currently undecided. And also, with the no contract offers now becoming more and more prevalent, we need, to, we need to be able to offer a solution which is deemed both cost effective for the user and more importantly, profitable for the operator. Um, it's quite easy, I think, in this market to actually lose money. Uh, according to PwC, uh, the pay TV business is evolving in response to the growth of OTT players now in people's homes. And I think we all know by now uh, that the way that consumers are accessing and paying for content has changed and is evolving around us with more and more broadcasters launching their own OTT services uh, to meet these demands of the new users and the increase in OTT players at home as well. Just looking at some of the statistics around that, um, you know, one of the key ones for me, there's two on here, uh, we'll see that the average weekly consumption of OTT viewing is set to reach you know, over 18 hours by 2020. And the key one for me is that 50% of global video consumption uh, will be non-linear. Uh, if somebody had said that to me a number of years ago, I, I probably would have um, questioned it. Uh, pay TV providers are desperately trying to fend off the cord cutting by embracing OTT and advising new products. I mean, a word or a, a title that we'd never heard of some years ago, uh, the skinny bundles. Cord cutting is increasing 2% year on year. Uh, so again, something we need to be very aware of. And service providers are expanding their market presence by offering their own OTT video services as well. Live TV, live TV viewership is falling, um, as we've seen in the US, it's declining by just under 13% year on year. In the UK, that's not quite as bad. It's currently declining at 5% year on year. But the key element to this is that we're all clambering for a slice uh, of the pie, and we're all chasing that potential $51 billion of revenue. So ensuring that we've currently got the correct business model to meet the ever-changing demands of our customers and to be ahead of those new entrants has probably never been more important than it is today. You know, we've seen TV is no longer a push industry, uh, especially with consumers. 
Consumers are wanting the smaller and more personalized package. Uh, they're also looking for things with no obligation. They want to watch what they want to watch, when they want to watch it, and more frequently on whichever device they want to watch it on as well. A recent report stated that majority of consumers want no more than 17 channels of content. So, you know, if you talk about unbundling, skinny bundles or smaller bundles, that's exactly what they're looking for. Um, they want to watch every channel that they have. They don't want to feel like supporting or subsidizing other channels. Um, I did a recent survey on how many channels are being offered out there. Virgin currently offering over 170 channels and Sky are offering over 200. Uh, in essence, viewers want to pay for what they want to watch and not what may be uh, their advised that they should be watching or what they feel they're subsidizing as well. If we look at some of the current OTT pricing models, um, OTT is nowhere near a new concept. It's already been proven success for a range of operators. The innovations that have happened in this space is coming from those one-time new entrants like Netflix, who are now established brands um, with you know, big moats as well as new niche players. Uh, people like HBO and Showtime are embracing OTT as a way of growing their pie. Um, in order to truly understand how best to accommodate the needs of our target audience, content owners now need to understand the current OTT models and which will best suit their business needs, you know, not just now but in the future, uh, and also that changing demographic of clients as well. So that one size certainly does not fit all. Um, if we look at a number of the, you know, what's out there currently, we've got SVOD, which is traditionally the Netflix type. We've got TVOD, um, which is Now TV, SF Anytimes, iTunes, 4OD, which is the ITV player, Hulula, Amazon, Prime, and currently Instant Video as well. If we just pick some of these to start with, well, if we first of all look at SVOD, um, SVOD very used in Europe and in the US, have absolutely rocketed over the last decade. In 2010, revenue stood at around $753 million in the US, and by 2020, it's predicted to increase by 700% to more than $6.5 billion. And globally, um, they're predicted to reach somewhere in the region of $21.6 billion as well, uh, growing from $7.6 billion in 2014. So you can see that massive rise in actually subscription. Um, the SVOD is one of the most successful business models financially. Uh, the subscription model allows you to regularly and upfront predict the income from the operator, and it's no resilience on that single one-off sale. Um, the benefits of SVOD for consumers is access to that unlimited and original content, choice of how you access the content, you know, the personalized recommendation engines, and some are also offering the parental control as well. And we've seen some of the major success stories. There's nobody more uh, success than probably Netflix. Netflix has seen been absolutely a game changer in the industry, and the company's revenues have reached 1.5 billion in Q1 2015. Their service has grown globally, uh, with the new company now launching across 150 companies, countries, sorry, in the next two years. So absolutely huge. Uh, you can just see them carrying on with that growth as well. And it's perfect for those who want a no obligation subscription and those who are addicted to series, the binges as we call them, uh, and they can watch a range of TV shows, movies, and also some original series as well. The increasing popularity of Netflix and Amazon has stimulated the market. We've seen a 76% increase in revenue uh, just on subscription and on-demand platforms in the UK alone. And according to Ofcom, very UK based, but according to Ofcom's communication market report, revenue for online subscription swelled to 111 million from 63 million in a 12 month period. So absolutely doubled in a very short period of time. And Netflix continue, they reached 1.5 million subscribers in 2013 and 62 million globally. Uh, and many who use the service to watch exclusive content such as House of Cards and other content that they provide. If we look now at one of the other areas, which is TVOD, transactional based, um, TVOD you know, provides customers the ability to dip in and out of the service when they want, offers them the ability to return when they want as well. They can purchase an individual piece of content um, as and when they want per movie, per series, per sports match. If we look at Sky Store, 
Sky Store uh, was really helping to Sky grow its customer base, not cannibalizing it, but helping it to grow. And that was doing it via pay TV services. With Sky having the first access to a range of movies, exclusive permission to broadcast certain sports events, Sky Store offers their customers access to premium content, whether they are currently TV, Sky TV customers or not. It provides consumers with the ability to buy or rent the latest movies, uh, and they can keep them on any device they want and across all devices. If we now look at AVOD, uh, AVOD is all about advertisement. Um, AVOD attracts those customers to the services by offering that free access to video content. You can build revenues from the advertisements you placed in or on your content as well. I mean, there's nobody more uh, is the dominant player than YouTube. Uh, YouTube of more than 1 billion users uh, with people watching hundreds of millions of hours of YouTube every day. Uh, frightening statistics, each month the number of the hours that people are watching YouTube is growing by 50% and revenue reached $4 billion in 2014. So absolutely the market leader as far as it comes to an AVOD service. However, some of the new ones that are entering are things such as a hybrid model. And hybrid models can target a broader range of consumers by giving them the choice between TVOD and SVOD. And it's fitting to how they want to pay and how they want to consume their content. The hybrid model can build revenue potential to both consumers willing to purchase a subscription, but also those who don't want to pay for that subscription but still want to consume content. And by appealing to that wider cross-section of consumers, new revenue streams can be created by cross-selling, upselling of services and content, to both the unsubscribed and the subscribed user. Amazon Instant Video is a great example. Considered one of the leading services outside of Netflix, as it can reach customers who use the Amazon Prime service, so therefore already have quite a massive database of potential consumers and the degree of consumption profiling. Amazon offers customers the choice between signing up to its Prime service with unlimited access to movies and TV shows, they can rent or buy videos. Uh, they can look at a blended solution, giving customers the choice of making them feel as though they are really in charge. And again, what it's doing is it's offering something for everybody, a model to match your individual requirements. And similar to Netflix, they have launched their own shows, such as Transparent, and have first access to other shows, such as Outlander as well. So again, own content, first to come with content, offering a solution for both the subscriber and those people who don't want to particularly be a subscriber. Some of the emerging models that we've seen out there, um, we have a number of models we've gone through, but you know, for bundles and alternative subscriptions, there are some alternatives. And what we're looking at here is a number of ways, you know, evolving that all you can eat model and segmenting and categorizing your content enables consumers just to choose the categories they want. So very much like a self-service type selection bundle. And customers want more of the buy side bundles with the option to pick and mix what they want. And again, absolutely reaches the hybrid model we just discussed. According to a recent survey, 2015 will be the year of the skinny bundle as customers demand the ability to reduce the channels they have to pay for uh, with the traditional packages and bundles. I just really want to pay for what I'm watching. I really want to pay just for what I consume. And as previously stated, the maximum number of channels a consumer really wants is around 17. They just want to pay for what they use. And operators are creating these skinny TV packages with internet services as an effort to attract the millennials and retain those subscribers on the idea that once you have them, you can upsell them. So once you've captured them, you can understand them a little bit more, you can gather data, build a persona, and sell more to them. It's stated that 82% of consumers prefer the a la carte pricing offering over the preset packages and preset channels. And again, you've got to be very careful about your price points, but some low entry price points, e.g. £5 a month, to entice consumers onto the service, which they can then add to extra bundles as and when they wish, or again, additional programs as and when they wish. And many consumers are interested in ditching their pricey cable contracts for that a la carte offering by streaming services. At first, the online choices were quite limited, but more and more services are springing up, creating that whole new class of TV watches called cord cutters. People who dump cable and satellite in favor of a content streamed online, but streaming only what they want. Uh, they may get sports on a pay-as-you-go pay basis and films on a low, no-obligation subscription service as well. 
And previously, operators bundled channels to subscribe other channels, which had low audience figures. And again, this is something we need to really closely monitor going forward. If we look at alternative subscription models, uh, I mean, we talk really much about only paying for what you use. Passes are becoming more increasingly popular, whether that be a day pass, week pass, or just a month pass. And again, you know, allowing you to sample the content, entice your customers to the service without feeling locked into that contract, enables you to attract new customers without cannibalizing your current services based on price points that you set. There is a point when a subscription becomes more cost effective than a continually purchasing a day pass. And again, as a marketeer, it's a great opportunity to upsell to a subscription. Day passes and week passes have become more and more popular, especially for sports events where you can purchase a pass for just one game, e.g. Wimbledon, the Ashes, or for a series of events. This allows users not to feel trapped into a contract and entices users more and more uh, to come on, try before you buy, where you wouldn't have got them before. Additionally, once you have a new user, you can monitor their behavior and they can look at their viewing habits and market you know, promotions specifically for what they're watching, both on device and both by content. You can also entice consumers by offering that ad-free subscription or based on devices such as a web package or an iPad-only package, even such things as HD or SD pricing as well. Device-based entitlement uh, works in a number of ways. It restricts access based on the type of device used uh, so that the users are restricted to constrained number of devices. And this has two benefits. Firstly, it prevents viewers from sharing authentication details. And secondly, it provides an upsell opportunity, enabling the user to choose a premium account in order to access an extended number of devices. Again, this really falls into, you can fall into metering as well. So one of the new areas that people are moving into is the metering of content. If we look at video metering, uh, we talk about freemium. Um, people come onto your website, uh, they're anonymous. Uh, viewers then are granted free access to content, either for a defined period, so it could be for an hour or two hours, or for a defined amount of content. You can view two pieces of content, or you can view one. And this can be an exchange for creating a profile. So give me some details about you, and we'll allow you to have an hour's worth of content. And this type of business model can also be supported initially with AVOD and then progress to SVOD. So until you start giving me details, it's AVOD, then you start giving me your details, we can move down to SVOD type basis, whether it be membership or a proper subscription. And video metering has become more and more. So people are opening up their sites, so such things as happy hour. This is a concept of opening up a paywall when traditionally low usage periods allowing users to view access to a certain amount of content for free whilst tracking their behavior and asking them for some details as well. And this concept is very much try before you buy with the option of targeting users with those very specific offers once you started to understand their behavior and their potential viewing packages. Again, and tracking that user, you know, tracking the viewer, whether they be anonymous or registered to understand what they're watching, what they're not watching, then to develop a specific offer around them. So very much we talked about the one size does not fit all. Again, if you see that somebody's just consuming sports or just consuming, you know, a certain genre of TV, then you can get a particular package that just meets them. And once you have them, obviously, you can then market to them. But this model really does drive acquisition as well of your individuals. The policies can be set depending upon whether the user is entering your site from, just for example, they're coming in from a competitor site, you might want to offer them an hour's worth of free content. Somebody coming in straight from Google, maybe you might not want to offer them any content or just watch the first 10 minutes. And this is coming very popular as well with thanks things of series. So for example, you could get to see for free uh, the first episode of a new series. However, to watch episode two, three, and four, you'd then have to subscribe or take out some form of pay to view. So again, a great way of getting new people on board. If we look at some of the other areas, um, some of the areas, ad revenue forecast in 2015 for legacy TV was around $59 billion, an OTT just over $8 billion. However, predicted going forward, um, legacy TV is going to drop, not massively, but to $47 billion, but OTT is literally going to treble 
to $31 billion by 2018. And advertising to subscribers who you know, I owe those people who are behind the wall, we have some idea of persona. You can start putting advertisement to them, which is very much in line with what they're viewing, in very much aligned to their habits. Just for example, Aston Martins go very well with the James Bond experience. And we've seen some we've seen some very good statistics coming back from this that any ad behind the paywall can attract seven times greater ad value. And also, when we're looking at the offline conversion rates of some significantly higher than those that aren't subscribed. And again, when we talk significantly higher, a recent study by an organization conducted in partnership with Comscore said that it was 70 times a multiplier for those people who were behind the paywall and subscribed. And this worked even better for premium brands too, such as BMW, Burberry, etc. If we now look at the future and try to understand what the future is going to bring for us, um, well, I don't think any of us really understand what the future have in store, but what we need to ensure uh, and we, we need to be aware of is the internet is changing the television industry forever. The video content is becoming even more accessible. The business model we operate today, um, I can probably guarantee, won't be the business model we'll be operating in five years. It may only be tweaked or it may be a massive change. And it's all about giving the consumers what they want, when they want it, and on the device they want to consume it on. And again, you know, we talk about the connected world. Well, this is getting more and more the connected world. Yeah. Technology as a user uh, behavior can also have an impact on the television creation of tomorrow. And I think, you know, a uh, little thing here, there is an opportunity, I think, for content creators, distributors, and consumers to create that all new TV that is both proactive rather than reactive, and again, constructive rather than limiting. Again, we have a great opportunity with the new products, new services, great content to really create that TV of the future. Just considering some of the takeaways from today, well, I think, you know, looking at flexible models and offering what the consumers want and when they want it is probably more important than it's ever been. Uh, people have more choices out there than they've ever had before and their demand for their money is greater than it's ever been before. So offering them what they want when they want it is absolutely key. And having the ability to have that flexibility to upsell, cross-sell, and devise different revenue streams as well, to have the platform to be able to do that is key moving forward. Um, one of the key areas, obviously, is making sure you've got a system and a platform that's scalable and is big enough to actually expand the way that your plans are going as well. And again, if we look at the whole of the targeting audience, you need to be able to target those undecided or those who don't want to commit. When we talk about the internet evolution, well, it's here and it's gonna continue and it's only gonna get greater and I think the opportunities are only gonna get greater too. So thank you very much for attending today. Um, all the questions that we've received will be sent out. Uh, to those who've um, been on the webinar today. But my name is Peter Brownbill. If you want to get in contact with me, please feel free, either through our website or through the telephone uh, numbers I'm on screen now, or you can contact us at sales at mppglobal.com. But thank you very much.